welcome back to All Hell Can't Stop Us. I'm Jeff Cliff, and this is a weekly broadcast, a weekly podcast, and record of the time. An alternative to the ACE, John Gormley here in Saskatchewan, the IFBI, the RAA, the NPAA, and other corporate media, as you might see on TV stations, CBC, that sort of thing. Yes, I include CBC in corporate media, but uh, this is a weekly show, and today is no exception. And you can help this weekly show exist and succeed in spreading liberation and freedom just by listening. You are resisting corporate media, and just by sharing this show with others, you can go to either my subscribe star or Mega and grab the MP3s directly, or go to the bit torrent and download the show which i encourage you to do to share and to even maybe even remix it or sell it or do whatever you want to do with it just take it and make it part of your world and do so in hopefully some kind of a creative way but this is uh the going to be the last serious show of the year just like last year i do intend on doing a special show on my birthday 31st of december whatever day of the week that is i have no idea what day it is i think it's sunday today so that would make it uh oh god what day is it that would be thursday thursday is going to be another show and hopefully we'll, we'll be doing something fun on that day but today is just another normal sunday there's nothing unusual about this week whatsoever there's nothing special about this week that isn't really uh marked different than any other week there's definitely no uh decorations out in the street uh put up a taxpayer expense at the benefit of one particular solstice uh, celebration or something nothing like that going on but actually no i wanted to point out i did make i don't exactly remember what i said last week but i do think that i got one of the details of one of the things that i talked about oh not necessarily wrong but i didn't quite get the full picture and over the past week one of the stories that i've had time to dig a little bit further into and to uh, actually get the real story is the matter of the nativity scene in Thunder Bay. And of course, I forgot to grab a drink of water, so I'll probably get parched halfway through this broadcast. But the nativity scene has been a yearly tradition and ritual with the the Knights of Columbus putting up a nativity scene, or as I call it, the Knights of that genocide era Columbus, of course. Christopher Columbus was a blood-soaked murderer and a rapist and all that sort of fun stuff. So there's all kinds of terrible things to come from him. Why anyone would use his namesake to name their group in the modern era is, is kind of curious. But anyway, they've been putting on this yearly nativity scene, and it is actually kind of a beautiful scene. Like, as an, a work of art, you can't fault it. It does bring smiles to the people who see it for the most part and blah, blah, blah. blah. But the rumor that had been going around was that people were either offended by it or didn't want to see it or didn't want to get rid of it. And uh, specifically the Satanists in, or at least the, what was it, the Church of Satan? Let's see, what did they sign? Oh, there we go. The Satanist community of Thunder Bay. There we go. Wanted something out of City Hall. So T-Bay News Watch threw this article up with some of the details of what they were asking for, but not the whole story. And I got my information from a skim of that article, whereas I probably should have actually gone to the the source given I actually know one of the people involved. So what the Satanist community of Thunder Bay actually asked the city for was about, quote, we would gladly add our own exhibit if given the opportunity, but it has been never made apparent to our knowledge that other groups are invited to participate, quote unquote. Da, 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 da. And so basically they're reminding them, that the city council in Thunder Bay, that there is this preference given to this one particular group, and that it has been going on for a while, and that it they are calling on, if I'm interpreting their letter correctly, the city to decide whether or not other groups will be allowed to have access to this public space, because it is a public space, the space in question. It's a very, they wrote a letter to the city asking to see if it's okay for them to make use of this public space. And usually what happens in other cities is one of two things. One, the city's okay with the nativity scenes staying up and this religious group having access to this public space. And so the Satanists tend to go to this same space and then put up their own thing. And then, so you have, as we kind of discussed them last week, the nativity scene, their artistic creative presentation of their faith, and then the Satanists and their creative artistic representation of their faith. And so there's a lot of people in Thunder Bay saying, well, if you don't like this nativity scene, well, then just don't look. Uh, and that there's nothing wrong with the government allowing this religious group to do this thing in this space that 
that wouldn't really be used for anything otherwise. If you have a problem with it, just don't look. And then of course the question is, would those same people still say, oh, just don't look if there was some kind of giant goat statue, for example, put up in the same space, or, or even a temporary goat statue. And knowing the particular Satanists involved, uh, if, if you can even call them Satanists, I guess the Satanist community can probably call them that, but uh, their goat art is beautiful and amazing, at least the last creative opportunity they had to put something together. It was um, just utterly amazing. But the Halloween costume was probably the best one I saw this year and it was a very, very convincing costume, and I'm sure if the, that particular person and the other particular people involved in that particular community wanted, they could make something that would be amazing and well worth coming to see in, this, in the public space. But of course, being surrounded by four churches, would that actually be allowed, is the question. And that is the question that they are posing to the city council, that at least at the, the civic level, the city level, would they also be granted access to that space? And so you have a whole Whole bunch of people freaking out and considering that oh the satanists want to cancel christmas and cancel this nativity display and get rid of it and all that and their letter says nothing of the sort and that they do say that quote any special permission from the city to display this fundamentally religious diorama should be discontinued or else be i.e unless it is opened up to every religion satanists included and so they don't want at all this thing to go away. They just want access to the same space. Now, personally, I'm not a big fan of the, the whole nativity thing, and I don't really care one way or another because I don't live there. But it is well worth considering, though, that what the particular community actually asked for was just access. And so you had this TV News Watch article that didn't really do a good job of expressing that. I probably could have done better last week. And there was a pretty big discussion on that, but I just wanted to kind of clear it up that no, they're not trying to get rid of it, that the Satanist community is pretty open-minded and pretty welcoming of other faiths, almost to an absurd degree. I would actually strongly disagree with some of the, the length to which they're open uh, to other faiths, being free and able to express themselves, and that's even saying something. So that's what's going on in Thunder Bay right now. And so there's Thunder Bay, but Thunder Bay is of course not the only thing going on. Uh, one of the things going on. I, I did actually invite a person with the online moniker uh, Misanthropic God, uh, who actually has been doing, or had been doing, something very similar to what I had been doing earlier this year. I did invite them, because when Rant Radio went down, and when Newsreel, the Sean Kennedy show, hit its 500th episode, and he stopped doing it, there was this kind of void left. Uh, and I talked about it in the first episode of this show, a little bit of how there's this need for something like this show, something like news to be made available to the rest of you so that we can talk about it, we can work our way through it, we can hit the crisis head on, whatever that crisis may be, whether it be COVID, whether it be the CASE Act, whether it be Cloudflare, whether it be Microsoft taking over GitHub, all of these things are happening in the tech world and the tech world's bleeding into the real world and the real world is bleeding back into the tech world and the reality is getting kind of fuzzy in places and it's hard to know sometimes what's going on and how to deal with it at a group and community level. But people like Misanthropic God have been trying to make sense of things and to present the information that you need to know to survive in the modern world. And so I listened to their first episode. I've been meaning to get to it for quite a while. And it was, a lot of it had to do with looking at the dark fantasies of anime and manga and cyberpunk in the 80s. And then doing like a compare contrast of what's going on in the real world right now and how close the darkest visions have been to the truth. And so the first episode is well worth a listen. I encourage everyone who takes the time to go through more than, say, one of my shows to definitely go check that show out. But that's not the only thing that I encountered this week. The other thing is actually in my personal life. I, and I am going to get to talking about Cloudflare in a future show. But again, this is not that show. We'll get to it in a later show. But there's this giant corporation, Cloudflare, that has been slowly but surely taking over the World Wide Web. And through the World Wide Web, a lot of services that kind of run in the background of things like the Internet of Things, all these little computers embedded in the world around us. You have uh, services, uh, not Facebook, not Google, not Apple, but a lot of the main websites that you use on a day-to-day -day basis. Things like the Government of Canada website, or at least some of the sub-websites of the Government of 
of Canada are run off of Cloudflare. You've got education systems, universities, big companies, and there's this complete lack of public knowledge that it's all run on the platform of this one company, or at least I mean, there are other companies that do this, but lots of the web and much of your life, you the listener, is currently involving this company that practically no one outside of the IT world has heard of. And so I have this project that I have with others across the internet tried to protest slash bring awareness slash make people understand the threat that Cloudflare poses to your life, to your society, to your government, to your business, to everything around you, and to keep a tally of what's going going on, and maybe not an organized way, but at least some kind of way, a giant ball of catamary damacy of things that are said about it, that are claimed about it, information about it, and not necessarily in an organized way, just like somewhere where it can all be stored so that maybe someday some grad student will dig through her notes and uh, see the full scope of the problem and write a book about it or something like that. Which, I mean, by the way, that was another thing that happened this year, is uh, I became a published author. I'm pretty sure I mentioned this in one of the previous shows, but that came out of this project where an article that I wrote was turned into an ebook and published and then censored and that is that whole backstory. But the point that, and the reason why I wanted to bring it up this week is again, somebody inside of our project has co-opted the, this project, this protest group, and deleted all of the materials and basically shut the whole project at the main website that we've been using down. Now, could it be that someone on the inside has lost their password and has been hacked by this company or someone representing them or possibly just a random troll, perhaps? Or maybe they have been part of the group since the beginning and have been pulling something of a long con on us. I don't know. I don't know exactly who did it, but somebody with right access who hasn't been answering my questions today certainly has deleted or has been the beneficiary of a deleted repository and all of our work, at, at least uh, the main copy of it, is gone and it's deleted. It's And it, it's totally this black ice cyberpunk corporation attacking information source type thing, right? Where you have this protest group with this website and it keeps getting attacked and keeps getting replaced by uh, nonsense information. And they have, pl they're fighting dirty on the Tor Project's website. They, ha they weren't, uh, were two different projects, this Tor Project and this anti-Cloudflare project. Uh, crime flare and they and then of course me being kind of a third party to the, all of this but on the tour project there was a couple of bug reports sent in basically saying there's this company that's getting more and more prominent and more and more troublesome to tour users and maybe we should do something about it and those bug tickets tended to link to my project this our anti-cloud flare project cloud flare tour whatever you want to call it there were many links from the tour project and these tickets to this project but over time any ticket that had one of these links would either get spammed uh, in one case they wound up posting child porn on the bug ticket and had the whole not just the bug ticket but all of the posts involved scraped and deleted and it, they've done all kinds of these things to, and now whether this is cloudflare the company doing this, somebody on their behalf doing this, or just some random troll doing this, can't prove that. But what we do know is they have benefited every time something like this has happened, and that there has been this uh, benefit to this company because their main protest group has been completely taken down or, or just like completely kneecapped. In this case, I don't know how many days, uh, it must have been a couple of days, no more than a couple of weeks, but certainly a couple of days since this repository was deleted and replaced with this guy holding a bunch of boxes. So it's weird that this, this thing is going on and that despite our best efforts, we've lost some data, but this is going on. Where is the news covering? this event happening. And it's not just me knowing this and not just me seeing this. Yeah, always keep a hard copy backup, which we did. I mean, I mean, my copy isn't a hard copy, it's still a soft copy, but we did have a backup. We are reverting from backup right now. And, but the problem is that we lost our main website that everyone knows to go to. And so right now you can go to codeberg.org slash the music god one slash cloudflare slash or dash tour. And you can get to my version. My version of it is an older, 
it's not like the most up to date version, but it's going to be the most up to date version because it's all that's left right now. So that's going to be the rally point. And other people are no already noticing this and already creating their own rally points in case that doesn't work. And so it's not going to be a completely successful attack on the side of the Cloudflare side. There is backups, but it's still a pain. It's still a pain. And why are we even having to deal with this? Like, we shouldn't have to worry about giant corporations attacking our protest group. Or at least I'd, I'd like to think that. Maybe that's too much to hope for. And maybe it's because they're attacking us. We know that we're having some kind of a, an effect. I don't know. Something along those lines. But we've got some comments from the peanut gallery that uh, 80s media sci-fi is about 80% accurate. It's kind of scary. I would totally agree with that. There's definitely a high level of accuracy, uh, especially in the longer term, in terms of sci-fi. And the longer we stretch things out, the more chance uh, horrible and terrible things have to happen. So that's worth keeping in mind. So that has been going on this week. The other thing going on, and I've been trying to keep a little bit of my finger on the pulse of this one, but I haven't had a very good place to get full details on this one. I meant, I'm pretty sure I mentioned it on previous shows, but the US Congress post-election now, has been organizing and trying to pass this giant bill that every, I'm not sure how often they pass these bills, but these NDAA bills, these defense, military, industrial complex, pay the bill bills. And in this particular one, I've got a tweet here from AOC, quote, it's not good enough to hear about what's in the bill. Members of Congress need to see and read the bills we are expected to vote on. I know it's, quote, controversial, unquote, but I get in trouble for sharing things like this, but the people of this country deserve to know they deserve better. Congress is expected to vote on the second largest bill in U.S. history today, i.e. a couple of days ago now, on the 21st, $2.5 trillion U.S., and as of about 1 p.m., members don't even have the legislative text of it yet. And on top of that, this thing is huge. This is like 5,000 pages that somehow these representatives were supposed to have A, read, or B, at least signed off on saying that they've read and passed. And they did. They passed it. The House passed it. The Senate passed it. Went to the president. My understanding of what happened is that the president vetoed it, but I haven't seen any proof of exactly what the the process was. So maybe he just threatened to veto it or something like that. But in any case, it went back to the House and back to the Senate and is being kicked around back and forth because it has to get approval, either the President and the House and the Senate, or some kind of super majority or large percentage of one or both of the House and Senate. I'm not exactly sure the details on that side, but the point is that there's this huge bill, uh, the second biggest change to, to U.S. law of history, and in addition to this money value and this change in the economics of the situation, they're also changing the copyright laws, and they're doing things like criminalizing streaming, I, what I'm doing, if there's any copyrighted material. And as someone who's been doing this every week for the past year and a half now, or what's it, almost two years now, it is hard to not accidentally include copyrighted material. Even I've been pretty strict about what material I allow on my show. And you can tell that I, I haven't had songs on the end of or a couple of these shows because I do try to make sure, though, if I'm giving you a, a song, that it's a Creative Commons song, that I have the right to give this song to you. And so that's a restriction on what I'm able to, to share with you. And even so, occasionally one of those songs has slipped through with the wrong Creative Commons uh, license. Or it was licensed under the Creative Commons, but it wasn't actually licensed under the Creative Commons, and one of the samples in that song wasn't actually cleared unbeknownst to the artist who released it under Creative Commons and unbeknownst to me, but not unbeknownst to the content ID system that YouTube uses and definitely wouldn't be unknown to some enterprising lawyer that would want to, say, charge me for, say, commercial <laughs> piracy or something along those lines. And yes, there is leniency for smaller, non-commercial entities. However, there are things that you can do that make things way worse for you. Uh, one of which is be something like WikiLeaks. Now, maybe it's not going to be WikiLeaks. Like the, WikiLeaks, I think, is a spent force uh, to some extent. While it is still going to continue on and still going to continue to change the world, if we're thinking in terms of WikiLeaks, we're stuck in the past. What made WikiLeaks exciting and what made it useful and valuable was it was something new that challenged the existing power structures of the world. And it allowed younger people to have access to information that the previous generation didn't necessarily want them to have access to. Eventually, this is going to happen again. 
Eventually, the new technology, whatever it is going to be, maybe it's going to be something like the Fediverse or maybe something like a blockchain powered system or who knows what the future may bring. But whatever it is, it's going to involve new groups of people coming together and doing new things that are going to challenge the RIA, challenge the big banks in the US, challenge the US government, and they're not going to like it. And those are the groups that this kind of copyright law is going to be wielded against if they have any kind of a media presence at all. And by media, I mean things like Twitch, things like their own personal Facebook streaming account, their group account, etc. And that's the sort of thing that won't be protected by this case bill, even to the extent that it does protect people, at least in my understanding of it. But the point being, though, is there's this huge change going on. And there's this massive deal being struck between the Democratic establishment and a couple of Republicans, I think, where they want to get money into the hands of the U.S. people. They want to basically bribe the U.S. public, take $600. And in exchange for that, we're going <laughs> to throw all kinds of money at uh, a whole bunch of different groups. And two, we're going to change the copyright law in a allow these companies to own and to gate culture in the United States and globally all that much more effectively. And so we've got a comment from the peanut gallery. He vetoed it because, yeah, so there's a couple of reasons why he vetoed it. And depending on the news source, I'm finding they give different answers for why. And so I do wonder how much of what the reason is that he vetoed it is the reasons he's giving and how much of it is just pure trolling, how much of it is just like proving that he has some relevance still and that he's still under the control of the U.S. government. But anyway, quote, because it violates a metric ton of civil liberties, if it was to be passed, making things that are considered public works illegal, it's basically a law that corporatizes all media and requires corporate-backed listeners' licenses. Yes, exactly. And so this is, this idea of a listener's license was a Sean Kennedy, I mean, it's not a Sean Kennedy idea. It was and remains, as far as I know, a real thing that happens in some countries. And where if you want to listen to music, if you want to listen to a Twitch stream or a, a Facebook stream like you're listening to right now or a YouTube stream like you're listening to in the future, you need to have permission from the government to do this. Or at least permission from the corporations who are charged with managing this kind of permission. And this is not an absurd thing. This has happened in the past. And the companies involved do want it. So we're quite at the point of having everything licensed yet, but we're taking big steps towards that happening. And so when you get that, like you could ask at that point, well, what's so wrong with that? Why, why should we care? I mean, I'll, I'll go out and get my license. I, I have a Netflix account. I have a Disney Plus account. I have a, you know, I don't get anything from the torrent networks. Why would I ever consume unlicensed media? Because the artists that are going to make the next great media, some of them are going to work for the, the, the big companies like Netflix. Some of them are going to work for the MPAA and make movies and that sort of thing. But you may notice that those artists refer to other art. They build on other art. And th there's always this kind of complaint of like, oh, it, media gets stale, right? We're making the, what, what is it? Is it Survivor 11? Or I was talking, I can't remember what series it was where I'm going to blank on it. And it doesn't matter. There's like a sequel after sequel after sequel because they get locked into these creative yes men bubbles where the, the creative people on the inside of the MPAA are stuck, surrounded by people who are not allowed to criticize or not allowed to build, not allowed to take and do better. And there's this cultural death that that happens within these systems. And yes, there is still life in Hollywood. Yes, there's a lot of creative people that throw the creative energy into these studios and into these animation studios, into these sinkholes for creativity. But there is this space for art and for culture and for music and for just life that exists outside of Netflix and Disney Plus. And there's so many people who live miserable lives and they go, they watch TV, they go to work, they come home, they watch TV, they go to work. And especially in this COVID era where there's, there's a lack of human contact and connection with the art itself. And there's a lack of connection of the lives that we live and the meaning that the, the art and the, the stories that are told, they aren't our story. They aren't told to us. They aren't concerned with us at all. We are the product in that case. And if we have to get permission to even listen to the story, never mind make the story, that it's just one more step to take, to, to get, to get able to have that story involve you at all. 
It's a predatory relationship, and it's not a relationship that's going to be good for your mental well-being, <laughs> etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I could probably keep going on that. But the point is, is that this case law, this sort of thing, has been proposed before. And this kind of overreach in copyright law has been fought over before and won. In the earlier part of this millennium, these kinds of restrictions were attempted with the SOPA and PIPA laws, which were fought and fought successfully. People were able to go in mass into the street. Now, back then, of course, you could go out into the street and protest. Now it's a little bit more tricky with this COVID business, but the it is still possible to beat this. And a lot of people, I think, have given up and just seen that, oh, it's hopeless and there's no way we can stop it. But SOPA was being passed. It looked the same way. It had a consensus on both sides of the Republican and Democrat parties in the states. It was had many co-sponsors. And yet, after people started calling in and threatening to vote against the party that they support and pulling their funding and finding the people who support or finding the companies who support this bill publicly and then boycotting and taking that step of contacting the companies and saying, listen, you're messing with the Internet. This is an important thing and an important part of the economy, important part of how we are connected right now in this global COVID pandemic. We need this Internet here. We need the ability to listen to opera singers sing in their despair in Italy. We need the ability to hear the songs the nurses are singing and being sung to. We need that little bit of extra hope. And otherwise, as this pandemic continues to restrict our ability to lead social lives, we are going to suffer for it. We're already seeing suicides start to creep up as people start to give up and lose that meaning of their life. And this is keeping that thing that keeps them alive. That music and culture and beauty, that art, it's restricting the availability of it to the people who need it most. And that is, or at least from what I've seen, the worst thing in this bill and this thing that is being steamrolled onto the American people and through them the rest of the world. And so it is worth fighting and it's worth getting and going across the aisle, reaching out to the Republicans, reaching out to the Democrats you wouldn't normally talk to, you wouldn't normally work with, and finding reasons to reach out to them and say, look, we disagree on everything else, but we have to stop this. And this is the one thing that we can find common ground with because we all use the internet. We all have music in our lives. We all have this, we're increasingly connected with smartphones and video and this streaming technology that is allowing us to have access to culture in a way that we haven't before. So anyway, more comments from the peanut gallery. So a uh, page scannings apparently has gone into uh, detail of this. And so if I can find a video or some kind of link, it says Wheelie. I'm going to click on that after the show of wheelie.com, uh, but quote, major corporations have been striving to control media in all forms because if they control how and why a person is able to access media, then they determine who is allowed to have that right. Yes, exactly. This is the key to the laws and rights the FTC is intended to regulate. The problem is many companies want market control of the media because they don't want competition and instead market dominance based on their enforced power. Exactly. So a lot of this has to do with restricting how many companies, just like as mentioned in the previous video, there's only so many of these companies. I actually went through the list yesterday and, and actually looked through and it's companies like Sony, Rupert Murdoch's giant octopus monster of companies. Those particular groups, those particular companies, i.e. the MPAA, <laughs> these companies are huge and they don't like it when their monopoly position or oligopoly position is threatened when their power over what you see and read when there is an alternative and that's actually the, the other point uh, that's kind of hard to get to because there's just so much going on here which is that even with this show even with creative commons music that is legal to play that is actually that i had permission from the creators of, of the music even in that case the automated systems that enforce this law don't care they are made to be as blunt as possible while still working and are more than willing to sacrifice our creative and their creative work and access to that creative work, access to that culture, access to that music. They're willing to sacrifice all of it to avoid liability and to avoid their themselves going to jail and getting caught under criminal penalties, that they're willing to avoid all this art being shared and created and made and distributed and remixed 
all of it, the reaction from the big tech platforms if something like this is pushed, is going to be to restrict what we are able to share and restrict what we are able to, to promote and to talk about and to, in the case of listener's license, it'll be to restrict what you can even get with your listener's license. Even if you are that law-abiding, upright citizen of the corporate empire, and even if you do go to the extent of getting that Netflix account and getting that Disney Plus account and getting that listener's license, you'll still be forbidden to have access to the content that does talk to you that does try to break through the barriers, that does try to just exist outside of their system because it will be viewed as competition and these automated systems will clamp down on it just the same as if you had stolen the content outright and were trying to pass it off as your own. They do not differentiate between these two things. These automated systems like Content ID do not differentiate between these two things. There's a long list of examples we could go through of these automated systems failing to properly account for the the subtle difference between who owns what and what kind of pattern uh, is perceived to be uh, part of what work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And just going back a couple of videos, uh, you can reread the What Color Are My Bits article. These systems are DRM systems. These systems are implicitly trying to solve an unsolvable problem that is the problem of what color are bits. And for more details on that, go read that article. It's well worth the read. But, although that's probably the most important thing going on this week, uh, it's not the only thing. There was a CTV video, and I wonder if I'm going to be able to pull anything useful out of it here. I can't even go to CTV. It's disgusting. There, But, okay, so long story short, my understanding of it here is that, and this is kind of going a little bit off the cuff, so we'll see how accurate this is, that in Ontario, there was recently a marriage between two First Nations people, and the marriage was conducted legally by some kind of First Nations official. Now, the title of that official, I don't know, because the video is broken, the link is broken, <laughs> so my details are kind of lost to me, but the point being is that two people fell in love. This is a straight, heterosexual couple. Two people. <laughs> I mean, not that gay marriage isn't really... Uh, unusual these days anyway, but there's just a couple, man, a woman, falls in love, gets married, goes to the place that they choose to get married, finds the official that wa they want to marry them, they profess their, their marriage vows or whatever the ritual that they do, and then they became legally married. Now, what was newsworthy about this is the official was not a priest, a representative of some kind of European or historically European Abrahamist church or faith. It was not a government official or someone acting as a government official. It wasn't a notary or someone acting as a notary. It was a person from that First Nation and a person who is culturally charged in that nation with the responsibility of marrying couples who love each other, which all human societies have some kind of a marriage ritual. It is a human, at least in my understanding, a human universal. And so this has been going on in this continent for time immemorial, and yet this is from CTV's vantage point the first time this was legal, which really makes me wonder, is native marriage legal here in Saskatchewan? Is it legal Canada wide? I didn't know that I had to ask this kind of question. But just like I had to ask, Ashley Hicks a couple of shows ago what the government policy of the NDP would be if they were to ever get in power on overturning the Sask Party's torture of gay teenagers legislation. There is this question that's not open. Is there a legal restriction on marriage by First Nations officials? I don't know. If you know and you're listening to this show, please get in touch because I didn't realize this is a question I needed to be asking, but I think that we should be asking this question because if it is not legal, this is the sort of thing we really should have fixed by now. I understand it's not something that comes up all the time. I mean, how often do people really get married? It's a once in a, maybe not a once in a lifetime thing, but for a lot of people, it's a once in a lifetime thing on average. And so, I mean, we've won gay marriage and we've, we can allow legally people to love each other, to get married, and that's great. And why don't we allow <laughs> native marriage too, right? It seems pretty obvious that if you have a native man and a native man or woman who fall in love, that they should be allowed to live together and to do their thing together. They're going to anyway. They, they, 
been doing that for a long time anyway. I'm actually dating a First Nations woman <laughs> right now. And so, like, it's not like this isn't going to happen anyway, but legally, it's the sort of thing that should be allowed, right? It's the sort of thing that if we're being honest about living together, settlers <laughs> and First Nations people on this continent, that uh, as far as there's control <laughs> happening over who's getting married to what, it should be as permitted as possible. So, quote, tribal union is legal if it is conducted on tribal land. So this is in the U.S. context. But if it's conducted on non-tribal land, it can be argued that it is not because it does not have authorizing for governing authority of the land. So, pause. So this is a good point because there is a difference between the way that the U.S. works and the way the U.S. treats their the American Indian tribes and the way that the Canadian government treats the First Nations people here. In that we here in Canada see ourselves as being on tribal lands. We are on native land. We are allowed to be here because we have signed treaties allowing for us to coexist in this way. And then there are some special areas like the downtown reserve here in Saskatoon that's Métis land. And then there's other land that's like specifically kept separate and very similar to the reserves in the, the U.S., to my understanding. And there's there's problems with the way that this is organized with the Indian Act, etc. But the problem is that there is this, in the U.S. context, there is a reason why that that might be the case. And the way that U.S. marriage law is developed, now maybe it's a good idea to have in the States too. I'm not an American and I'm not going <laughs> to delve into American tribal relationships, but here in Canada, we are trying to make peace with our First Nations tribes and First Nations, right? It is a it's something that the government of the day is openly trying to uh, have a spirit of reconciliation as messed up and broken as that has been over the course of the Trudeau government. And see the What's Wetton video from a couple of months ago. We can go into that, but at least there's this attempt of living together peaceably, and it's an easy way to do it. It's an easy, no-brainer solution to at least getting one step closer to that sort of environment where we're not, as the Trump administration was doing to the, I think it was the Cherokee, where they promised to provide all this COVID support and then they just failed. And the nation had to appeal to groups like the government of, or the people of Ireland to help support them because of the complete lack of support from the Trump administration, et cetera, et cetera. But from the peanut gallery, 43 years of my parents being together. Yeah. So exactly. Like it's tough to get a relationship to last that long. It's uh, an important thing to encourage to have this kind of stable family life where people can be in a relationship for extended periods of time, long enough to, to maybe raise a child, that sort of thing. So quote here in the U S we have to have an ordained person to sign off on the documentation to a marriage or of marriage for it to be legally recognized based within the laws of the state slash federal, but tribal land is legally a different country. Exactly. So, and, th and that's why I didn't want to like compare the two directly because legally there is this more of a distinct society status uh, in the United States, at least in my understanding for tribes in, for example, places like Oklahoma, where it really is a little bit more separate. So there is an understandable reason why the laws are kept separate because after all, if the laws aren't kept separate, if they are allowed to bleed together. It's just as easy that that might work to the disadvantage of the American Indian tribe, right? If the U.S. government decides who is married and who's not, that's loss of the sovereignty of the tribe. However, this in this particular example, this wouldn't be a loss of anyone's sovereignty. This would be just an acknowledgement on the Canadian government's side of the responsibility over that particular part of domestic life on the part of the First Nation here. So anyway, continuing on, quote, a tribal land is legally a different country and therefore allowed to conduct their own laws and standards based on the, the rules so long as they do not violate federal law. Exactly. So, and that's an important thing for the Americans to, to kind of work out on their own, on their side. I, I don't want to get too involved in the American side on that, especially when there's other more important things like on the American side. For example, the CASE Act. That is relevant to hear us here in Canada because our media takes place through American companies. Facebook is an American company. When they implement this law, even though I'm going to be consuming Canadian content through this service that is going to be here. The American law is going to be the one that governs that Canadian content. 
even if I'm consuming Canadian culture through YouTube or through even BitChute and Twitch and all these other companies and their services, it's going to be governed under U.S. law. So this does affect us here in Canada. Our government, the CBC, should be screaming from the rooftops, should be handing out pamphlets because they can do this at least. They've got the printing presses. They've got the ability to tell the Canadian citizens to help our American neighbors see that they're about to break things for us. They should be helping the Canadian public, but again, they're not. Uh, but you out there, you know that this is going on, so you can talk to the people in your life. You can become more informed. You can do some research on your own. What is the Q saying? Do your own research. That sort of thing. You can go out into the world and find out more about this CASE Act and why it is so broken. You can go to the EFS website and learn about the CASE Act and help the Americans in your life understand that this is something they can fight. This is something they can stand up against. And if that doesn't work, if they pass it anyway, if they ignore the, the public and just chance this giant bill of graft and corruption and put it into law anyway, well, the I know the Alex Jones crowd is going to be on uh, going to the capital of the U.S. on the 6th when the uh, next president is going to be sworn in. So who knows? Maybe they could use some support on your side, too. It might be worth thinking about. But it's worth considering that there's going to be some the American political system is going to be coming under tremendous tremendous stress in the next couple of weeks as their new president is sworn in. And this is a chance for those of you out there in the States to actually do something about your corrupt and beyond malfunctioning government and to uh, maybe make some changes. So with that, I will leave you for the week and hopefully hear from you all and see you all next week. I will end with the goodbye song again today because uh, I haven't heard that in a little while. But just as a reminder, you can go to my subscribe star.com slash Jeff dash cliff to support this show specifically and you can at any time send me links or story ideas to talk about or uh, news events that are going on or music, Creative Commons music or uh, public domain music or some kind of music that is publicly shareable and I will go through it and hopefully if I have a little bit of time in between editing these shows, I am a couple of shows behind in editing, uh, I will try to put it on the end of the show or maybe even in the beginning of the show and we will uh, go from there. So hopefully uh, you, you will all be there next week and I will see you all then. Just a moment.